I mean, it's funny. I came home the other day and I'm always fighting with my kids. I got a 12 year old and a 10 year, a 13 year old and a 10 year old and, you know, always fighting with them over screen time. Right. And, uh, you know, I come home and my daughter's on the, on the iPad. I'm like, what are you, what are you watching? What are you doing? She's like, I'm watching Wild Hope. I'm like, oh, okay. I guess wow. I can't tell you. Wow, congrats. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. He was watching the turtle <laughs> episode. Seminal and, dad uh, moment right there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, my name is Tom Cosgrove. I'm the chief creative and content officer at earthday.org and welcome to 22 minutes with Jared Lipworth. Um, as head of studio, Jared Lipworth directs the HHMI Tangled Bank Studios mission strategy and editorial focus with an emphasis on the power of storytelling to inspire interest in science and nature. He oversees the studio's documentary content and its public engagement and educational outreach efforts. Uh, Jared has deep industry experience as an editorially focused production executive, writer, and co-production partner. Currently serves on the executive committees of Jackson Wild, a global forum and film festival at the nexus of nature, science, and climate, and Reverse the Red, an international initiative that promotes science-based conservation collaboration to prevent biodiversity loss. So, Jared, thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> Um, so I've been watching and enjoying uh, Wild Hope, which I hope we can we can talk a lot about today. Um, you recently launched documentary series, and, and it made me wonder. We could go. We could do a whole show just on your background. Probably you've made so many films and series on all kinds of topics in your in your career. Um, how, how did your journey in the film industry kind of lead you to focus on environmental topics um, such as what we see in Wild Hope? I think for me, it really started before my career in the film industry. Um, I was born in South Africa. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to be able to spend a good amount of time in game reserves and national parks as a kid, and I've always had a real interest in science and uh, in natural history and nature. Uh, what I what I discovered early on in my career is the power of storytelling. I was um, one of the first series I worked on was a series called Secrets of the Dead, which was using forensic archaeology to explore mysteries from the past. Didn't great title, by the way. In, <laughs> a lot of fun, so great series to make. Um, didn't have a lot of interest in history before that as a student, but when I started uh, getting into these stories and making these films, um, I just fell in love with it. And I fell in love with the medium uh, to be able to get people interested in topics they never thought they would. Um, when you're telling a good story, you can sneak a lot of science in um, and a lot of information in. And so uh, kind of it all came together for me really with Wild Hope where we can tell conservation stories, we can tell story, stories that are based in science, uh, that are positive and, uh, and optimistic um, in a way that uh, really we hope will engage people and get them thinking about what they can do. So it has been sort of a part of of your your career all the way along, your mission as a as a filmmaker, I guess, huh? You know, I'm not a scientist. Um, I you know, I, I used to joke I wanted to go out and be the guy who spends 16 years studying lions. Then I wanted to go out and be the guy who spends six <laughs> months filming the guy who went out uh, and studied lions. I found you know watching this series, I found <clears throat> it seems pretty unique in that, it, like a lot of nature based films, it, it shows you know the incredible aspects and, and beauty of nature and all that, but. I think it, what what you did so well is to go a step further and really show how we can cooperate with nature to build solutions. I think maybe it was the first episode took place in New York Harbor, which is not you know sort of a typical place you think nature. <laughs> um, how did you go about sort of finding all these stories from you know across the across the planet, really? We Well, we came up with the idea for the series based on Andrew Bomford's book, Wild Hope. And uh, we read that book and, you know, sort of that, that, that featured 10 stories uh, from around the world, really different conservation stories. And I think we instantly recognized that there was something there. They were so different from each other. Uh, they had such different approaches, but they were all about local engagement. So we had a premise that we were working on that unlike climate change, which is global and 
therefore requires global solutions. Biodiversity loss is often local and therefore local solutions can work. So that was our overarching premise. And then we set out to find stories and man, we found a lot of them. I mean, we had a database before we ever went into production. I think it was somewhere in the range of 150 or so stories. Oh, wow. You know, one of the things when you're when you're building a series, it's easy to think about what's episode one, two, three, five, but what is episode 20? What is episode yeah. 30? And we just looked at this and we thought, you know what? We're not going to run out of stories. It's a people series. Yeah. This is about people who are taking action who are, um, you know, taking solutions into their own hands. And so that that was sort of one of the lenses we looked for as we went set out to find the stories. But you mentioned Billion Oyster Project. Uh, yeah. That was it still is one of my favorites. It had so many elements to it that were exactly what we were trying to do uh, with Wild Hope. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I mean, I, I started watching it thinking it was going to be about one thing. You know, this man's mission with the billion oysters and then it kind of turned into a whole nother solution based thing that could help, you know, protect New York City. So it was kind of an incredible uh, full length story. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. Um, so it's it's about the Billion Oyster Project. Um, it had, again, as I said, it had so many elements going for it. It was this amazing urban project. I mean, what better setting for a natural history story than with the New York skyline in the background? <laughs> um, it had an incredibly passionate, realistic, relatable character in Pete Malinowski, who started the project. Um, yeah, I love his story. He was not a good student. He didn't like the way... Um, the way he learned. And so he tried to change it, became a teacher. And then that at a, at a pretty innovative school in New York city. And then that led to the billion oyster project. Um, it, it's, it's a really solution oriented project and you learn a lot, um, as you're going through it, just the, you know, the, the, the memorable moments in that film, uh, hearing him talk about uh, his life, his, you know, his his time as a student and how he wanted to do things differently for students like him, um, watching the oysters clean the fish tank. Uh, I mean, it's sort of mind blowing. You know, I think uh, I always think there's probably two or three things most people remember when they watch a film. Well, that was one of them for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you guys also had another um Great story, I thought, that um, intersects a little bit with what, the work we do here at EarthDay.org and then just my personal love of coffee. Um, <laughs> we, we have a program here called The Canopy Project, which is all about, uh, you know, uh, canopy restoration and, and, and local engagement with the communities. And I thought um, the episode you did around um, Mount Gorongosa, I hope I got that right, in Mozambique, um, was was incredible and a, a kind of angle I don't think most people know about or hear about um, and a really cool intersection of how, you know, we can use nature for multiple purposes. Yeah, you're picking all my favorites. Uh, not the <laughs> yeah, right. I, love, I love all the children. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Goring Goza is an incredible place. It's a national park in Mozambique that was devastated during a, a decades-long civil war um, and has been resurrected as a national park um, in, in a way that is – I think really indicative of the new model for conservation in the 21st century. It's uh, it used to be a colonial era national park. Now it's a national park that is designed to uh, bring benefit to the local communities that live around it. And there's so many different programs within the park that do that. The one we focused on in this film is the coffee program. So adjacent to the park itself is Mount Gorongosa, which is the watershed for the park and for the uh, 200,000 and people who live around it. Um, it's a rainforest mountain, um, and it had been pretty much devastated. They were harvesting, they were cutting down the trees uh, in the rainforest to uh, grow subsistence crops. And Gorongosa started a project where they taught the local farmers, provided the supplies and taught the local farmers how to grow coffee, shade grown coffee um, on the mountain instead of maize and other crops that require clear cutting. Right. Um, there's so many layers to the story because on one hand, the coffee requires shade. So if you're going to plant the coffee, you also need the shade trees that make up the rainforest. Um, the, the, the park buys the coffee from the farmers um, and then the, the profits go back into the local communities and into the park. So it's basically created an industry where a, a sustainable industry where the farmers are 
growing coffee, coffee selling coffee, processing coffee um, in a way that is benefiting them themselves in their communities, um, and also the 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 animal, the wildlife in the national park, and the whole ecosystem and the whole uh, the whole area. So. Um, you know, really, really simple idea, really, really well executed and a model for uh, for what can happen in other places. Yeah, it's really cool because you, you get to see the whole process right from, you know, if you're just interested in, in coffee like I am, and many of us are just sort of seeing that process and how it works and, and that, that particular type. Um, but also that whole intersection of, you know, the many ways it's helping many different people and species. Okay, so I'm also a, a dog lover. Um, my dog's over there somewhere watching me probably at this moment. Um, and you had a great episode. Um, I think it was called Canine Conservationists. But in, in any case, um, some amazing dogs doing amazing work down in Australia. I'll be, I'll be completely honest. I'm a cat person. I think the hard part with that episode is figuring out which stories to tell because dogs mm -hmm. really are being used in so many incredible ways. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this, uh, this film features um, efforts there to help get rid of invasive foxes that are devastating some of the, uh, the wildlife in Australia. I mean, invasive species in Australia is a, is a huge, huge conservation problem. And then the other story we look at is, is, koalas and how they're being used to uh, to help map um, the habitats of the koalas as they get more and more fragmented so that uh, they can then use that knowledge to create corridors and to create overpasses to help connect different koala territories. So, I mean, you know, dogs in conservation, they're, 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 they're finding more and more ways all over the world um, where they can be a benefit. And, uh, you know, these ones are pretty spectacular. Can you talk a little bit about just sort of, you know, how difficult it can be and some of the challenges of, of capturing animals in the wild and, and otherwise um, during the process. These were relatively quick shoots. Um, they oh, were designed okay. to, um, to be about the people. But of course, you yeah. have to you have to fill it in. You have to let people fall in love with the animals. And so, you know, we work very hard to to find the material either that we're getting when we're there or from the folks who are down there all the time to make those stories work. This is a people series as we intended it to be. But um you know, part of the inspiration is falling in love with nature. That happened yeah. to me as a kid. Right. Um, and I want to make sure that we give everybody the opportunity to have the same thing happen to them. Any, any sort of anecdotes you can share um, when, you know, making the series that are especially memorable for you? Any, any favorite scenes or moments that kind of popped out or unexpected, uh, unexpected things that, that came through as you were? You're making the films. I think there was there was definitely an element of drinking out of a fire hose. Um, it, <laughs> these films were all coming fast and furious, yeah. and um, yeah, I think it was an interesting um, an interesting editorial process to get the most out of each story, to make sure that they were character driven, to be um, telling them from local perspectives, um, also picking up on some of the, the universal themes across them. Um, I, I, you know, early on, we realized not at all by, you know, by intention that five of our first eight stories had farmers at their center. Uh, interesting. Um, yeah. You know, that was a revelation. I mean, it makes sense when you think about sure. it. Of course, farmers are going to be at the center of them. Um, so I, I think that was pretty, pretty neat, pretty interesting. The one story from Andrew Bomford's original book that made it into the series was our woodpecker story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. you know, a story where it's the, the U.S. military uh, who are actually doing a better job of conservation than the conservationists. And they joined <laughs> forces and now they have protected this incredible bird and um, and convinced local landowners to to join in that protection. So um, I think that's what we're, for me, finding those unexpected alliances, finding those, um, those people who are thinking about things a little bit differently um, is what I find so appealing and what I hope will resonate with the audience as well. Were you always thinking about it as a global series? I mean, you're going from Mozambique to Australia to New York to Florida to you know, all over all over the world. Um, was that an important part 
uh, to you of sort of the this, this series arc? No, that was very intentional. From the beginning, our one of our goals as a as a mission driven uh, nonprofit studio are we have outreach goals, we have mission goals, and this is the kind of project where we wanted to make sure that it would resonate with as many people as possible around the world. We wanted to make sure that the the stories were available to people around the world um, as freely as possible. So, uh, and also we wanted to show the diversity of approaches to conservation. How do you see, you know, Wild Hope and, and other, other film series uh, in a similar nature, kind of inspiring audiences to, to find their, you know, passion project or become, you know, a change maker in their own right? You know, when we talk about it, we say it's, it's, it's not a series, it's a movement. Um, and we really believe that we're trying to start a movement. We're trying to show, you know, there's so much doom and gloom out there. And rightfully so. There's a lot of horrible stuff going on when it comes to climate change and the environment. But there's also a lot of incredible work being done. And uh, we as a studio feel it's really important to showcase those positive stories, to give people inspiration, to give people a sense that all is not lost. Um, otherwise, how do you get up in the morning? So for every episode, we've got a lot of different ways for people to get involved. Sometimes it's just donate. Sometimes it's do something in your backyard. Sometimes it's get involved in a local organization. But we want to try to provide as many different ways for or for people and organizations to get involved so that they can find what works for them. You, you mentioned uh, the line, uh, it's not a series, it's a movement. We at Earth Day say it's not a day, it's a movement. Um, similar kind of uh, philosophy, I think. Um, I'm just curious how how you think about about Earth Day and its importance, and um, you know, will you be marking Earth Day next year with the series or otherwise? Any any plans or, or sort of how do you think about Earth Day generally? Yeah, um, you know, I've always loved Earth Day. I mean, back in high school, I remember going into Central Park in New York City for you know a big Earth Day concert and celebration. I think it's a, it's a really important day to to mark a moment and to you know it's in the spring it's getting people thinking optimistically about what they can do to protect the planet that said i mean as you said it's not a day it's a movement it's it's got to be a constant drumbeat um yeah. you know that day can get really busy when everybody is trying to just put their message out there on that day so i think the importance is how do you then take it beyond that day and how do you create that constant drumbeat that's there all year round and and in yeah. all different places yeah um, as far as our plans go, I have some personal goals. I've got a section of, uh, of our yard that I would like to rewild, but um, I think we are we're trying to make a big deal out of that around Earth Day and, and in April so that we can, again, just feels like a really fun, uh, simple way to help people get their hands dirty and see yeah. that they can start making a difference. No, that's great. That's great. Um, our, so, you know, every year for Earth Day, we create a theme, a global theme. Um, this year, it's Planet versus Plastics, and we're really talking about um, plastics as you know the pollution issue that most people know about, but also um, a health issue, both for humans and, and just biodiversity generally. Um, and I'm just curious in this series, whether uh, it's in existing episodes or in the future, um, have you come across some challenges and or solutions um, related to plastics um, uh, in any of the arcs uh, so far? Well, funny you should ask. Um, <laughs> we, I was just reviewing a, a rough cut the other day of an episode coming up in season two. That is, uh, the entire episode is about um, about plastics and uh, oh, cleaning up the ocean. Um, so it's uh, it's a story that uh, it's a film that um, features Boyan Slat's ocean cleanup project. Um, he's doing some incredible work out in the open ocean with the uh, uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and other of the big gyres to uh, to clean up ocean plastics and another great story about a person who uh you know he got involved in this as a kid when he went scuba diving and saw more plastic than fish so yeah. it's those moments that change your life that lead to a lifelong passion um and you know he's a perfect example of that so i'm really excited about that episode that comes out this spring well i'll, I'll definitely be watching that one for sure thank you um yeah i noticed too there was an episode uh you guys were um exploring leatherback turtles and um, I think they had mentioned that, uh, that because they feed on jellyfish, um, 
And because there's so many plastic bags in the ocean, they're often confused by that and end up feeding on and sometimes are killed by the plastic bags, sometimes the, the fish netting and all of that. And, and so I think you know, it's great you guys are exploring the, the oceans and waterways because it does seem like there's obviously some very serious health uh, and pollution implications there. So. Yeah. And leatherbacks, leatherbacks in particular, you know, there's so much we don't know about them. We know, you know, we know where they, where they breed. We know where they, um, you know, where they are, spend a good deal of their time as adults, but then there's this big window when they're young that we really don't know much about. So our, our, we're looking at some of those efforts to, um, to put radio tags on them early and start to fill in the blanks, which again, then leads you to the protection of those areas where they're most vulnerable. So, um, yeah, you know, plastic is, is one of those issues that certainly sea turtles um, are, are, are affected by in a big way. Well, Jared, just to, to conclude maybe, um, you know, with climate change, invasive species, habitat loss, all these human-driven events, um, and, and many others that you touch on in the series, what, what's your big hope, you know, personally for the future uh, of the planet and all the species that call it home? What, what do you hope to see? not just from the series, but from, you know, the folks that are doing all this work and, and making this kind of change? Uh, yeah, just a small question to finish off with. Just right? a little one. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I'd like to see a world where we're embracing nature for its own benefit, not just for our benefit. I'd like to see a world where we are recognizing the importance of science and the ability of science to solve problems. Um, I'd like to see a case where, you know, the rights of nature becomes a global phenomenon and, and that it's not unusual and unexpected. Um, we, we need to recognize that nature is important, not just to us, but to our planet. And it's important for its own right, not just for our benefit. So um, we got a long way to go, but as I think we're finding with Wild Hope, there are people who are fighting the good fight and making a difference. Well, I think we can all share those hopes. Um, Jared Lipworth, thanks for spending 22 minutes with us today. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it.